Chapter Eleven of the Jungle Book by Rudyard Kipling. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Chenevere. Her Majesty's Servants and Parade Song of the Camp Animals. Her Majesty's Servants. You can work it out by fractions or by simple rule of three, but the way of Tweedledum is not the way of Tweedledee. You can twist it, you can turn it, you can plait it till you drop, but the way of Pilly Winkies, not the way of Winky Pop. It had been raining heavily for one whole month, raining on a camp of thirty thousand men and thousands of camels, elephants, horses, bullocks, and mules, all gathered together at a place called Rawalpindi to be reviewed by the Viceroy of India. He was receiving a visit from the Amir of Afghanistan, a wild king of a very wild country. The Amir had brought with him for a bodyguard eight hundred men and horses who had never seen a camp or a locomotive before in their lives. Savage men and savage horses from somewhere at the back of Central Asia. Every night a mob of these horses would be sure to break their heel ropes and stampede up and down the camp through the mud in the dark, or the camels would break loose and run about and fall over the ropes of the tents, and you can imagine how pleasant that was for men trying to go to sleep. My tent lay far away from the camel lines, and I thought it was safe. But one night a man popped his head in and shouted, Get out, quick! They're coming! My tent's gone! I knew who they were, so I put on my boots and waterproof and scuttled out into the slush. Little Vixen, my fox terrier, went out through the other side, and then there was a roaring and a grunting and bubbling, and I saw the tent cave in as the pole snapped and began to dance about like a mad ghost. A camel had blundered into it, and, wet and angry as I was, I could not help laughing. Then I ran on, because I did not know how many camels might have got loose, and before long I was out of sight of the camp, ploughing my way through the mud. At last I fell over the tail end of a gun, and by that I knew I was somewhere near the artillery lines, where the cannon were stacked at night. As I did not want to plowter about any more in the drizzle and the dark, I put my waterproof over the muzzle of one gun and made a sort of wigwam with two or three rammers that I found, and lay along the tail of another gun, wondering where Vixen had got to and where I might be. Just as I was getting ready to go to sleep, I heard a jingle of harness and a grunt, and a mule passed me shaking his wet ears. He belonged to a screw-gun battery, for I could hear the rattle of the straps and rings and chains and things on his saddle-pad. The screw-guns are tiny little cannon made in two pieces that are screwed together when the time comes to use them. They are used up mountains, anywhere that a mule can find a road, and they are very useful for fighting in rocky country. Behind the mule there was a camel with his big soft feet squelching and slipping in the mud, and his neck bobbing to and fro like a strayed hen's. Luckily I knew enough of beast language not wild beast language, but camp beast language, of course, from the natives to know what he was saying. He must have been the one that flopped into my tent, for he called to the mule, What shall I do? Where shall I go? I have fought with a white thing that waved, and it took a stick and hit me on the neck. That was my broken tent pole, and I was very glad to know it. Shall we run on? Oh, it was you, said the mule. You and your friends that have been disturbing the camp? All right, you'll be beaten for this in the morning. But I may as well give you something on account now. I heard the harness jingle as the mule backed and caught the camel two kicks in the ribs that rang like a drum. Another time, he said, you'll know better than to run through a mule battery at night shouting thieves and fire. Sit down and keep your silly neck quiet." The camel doubled up camel fashion, like a two-foot rule, and sat down whimpering. There was a regular beat of hoofs in the darkness, and a big troop-horse cantered up as steadily as though he were on parade, jumped a gun-tail, and landed close to the mule. "'It's disgraceful,' he said, blowing out his nostrils. 
Those camels have racketed through our lines again the third time this week. How's a horse to keep his condition if he isn't allowed to sleep? Who's here?" "'I'm the breech-piece mule of number two gun of the first screw battery,' said the mule. "'And the other's one of your friends. He's waked me up, too. Who are you?' "'Number fifteen, E Troop, Knight Lancers, Dick Cunliffe's horse. Stand over a little there.' "'Oh, beg your pardon,' said the mule. "'It's too dark to see much. Aren't these camels too sickening for anything? I walked out of my lines to get a little peace and quiet here." "'My lords,' said the camel humbly, "'we dreamed bad dreams in the night, and we were very much afraid. I am only a baggage camel of the thirty-ninth Native Infantry, and I am not as brave as you are, my lords.' "'Then why didn't you stay and carry baggage for the thirty-ninth Native Infantry, instead of running all round the camp?' said the mule. They were such very bad dreams," said the camel. I am sorry. Listen, what is that? Shall we run on again?" Sit down, said the mule, or you'll snap your long stick legs between the guns. He cocked one ear and listened. Bullocks, he said. Gun bullocks. On my word, you and your friends have waked the camp very thoroughly. It takes a good deal of prodding to put up a gun bullock. I heard a chain dragging along the ground, and a yoke of the great sulky white bullocks that drag the heavy siege-guns, when the elephants won't go any nearer to the firing, came shouldering along together. And almost stepping on the chain was another battery mule calling wildly for Billy. "'That's one of our recruits,' said the old mule to the troop horse. "'He's calling for me. Here, youngster, stop squealing. The dark never hurt anybody yet.' The gun bullocks lay down together and began chewing the cud, but the young mule huddled close to Billy. Things, he said, fearful and horrible, Billy. They came into our lines while we were asleep. Do you think they'll kill us? I've a very great mind to give you a number one kicking, said Billy. The idea of a fourteen-hand mule with your training disgracing the battery before this gentleman. "'Gently, gently,' said the troop horse. "'Remember, they are always like this to begin with. The first time I ever saw a man—it was in Australia, when I was a three-year-old— I ran for half a day, and if I'd seen a camel I should have been running still. Nearly all our horses for the English cavalry are brought to India from Australia, and are broken in by the troopers themselves. "'True enough,' said Billy. "'Stop shaking, youngster.' The first time they put the full harness with all its chains on my back, I stood on my forelegs and kicked every bit of it off. I hadn't learned the real science of kicking then, but the battery said they'd never seen anything like it. "'But this wasn't harness or anything that jingled,' said the young mule. "'I know I don't mind that now, Billy. It was things, like trees, and they fell up and down the lines and bubbled and my head rope broke, and I couldn't find my driver, and I couldn't find you, Billy, so I ran off with—with uh, with these gentlemen." Hmm, said Billy. As soon as I heard the camels were loose, I came away on my own account. When a battery, a screw-gun mule, calls gun bullocks gentlemen, he must be very badly shaken up. Who are you fellows on the ground there? The gun bullocks rolled their cuds and answered both together. The seventh yoke of the first gun of the big gun battery. We were asleep when the camels came, but when we were trampled on we got up and walked away. It is better to lie quiet in the mud than to be disturbed on good bedding. We told your friend here that there was nothing to be afraid of, but he knew so much that he thought otherwise. Huh. They went on chewing. That comes of being afraid, said Billy. You get laughed at by gun bullocks. I hope you like it, young'un." The young mule's teeth snapped, and I heard him say something about not being afraid of any beefy old bullock in the world, but the bullocks only clicked their horns together and went on chewing. "'Now don't be angry after you've been afraid. That's the worst kind of cowardice,' said the troop horse. Anybody can be forgiven for being scared in the night, I think, if they see things they don't understand. 
We've broken out of our pickets, again and again, four hundred and fifty of us, just because a new recruit got to telling tales of whip snakes at home in Australia, till we were scared to death of the loose ends of our head ropes. That is all very well in camp, said Billy. I'm not above stampeding myself, for the fun of the thing, when I haven't been out for a day or two. But what do you do on active service? Oh, that's quite another set of new shoes, said the troop horse. Dick Cunliffe's on my back then, and he drives his knees into me, and all I have to do is watch where I am putting my feet, and to keep my hind legs well under me and be bridle-wise. What's bridle-wise? said the young mule. By the blue gums of the black blocks, snorted the troop horse, do you mean to say that you aren't taught to be bridle-wise in your business? How can you do anything unless you can spin round at once when the rein is pressed on your neck? It means life or death to your man, and of course that's life and death to you. Get round with your hind legs under you the instant you feel the rein on your neck. If you haven't room to swing round, rear up a little and come round on your hind legs. That's being bridle-wise." "'We aren't taught that way,' said Billy the Mule stiffly. "'We're taught to obey the man at our head. Step off when he says so, and step in when he says so. I suppose it comes to the same thing. Now, with all this fine fancy business and rearing, which must be very bad for your hocks, what do you do?' "'That depends,' said the troop horse. Generally I have to go in among a lot of yelling, hairy men with knives, long, shiny knives, worse than farrier's knives, and I have to take care that Dick's boot is just touching the next man's boot without crushing it. I can see Dick's lance to the right of my right eye, and I know I'm safe. I shouldn't care to be the man or horse that stood up to Dick and me when we're in a hurry." "'Don't the knives hurt?' said the young mule. Well, I got one cut across the chest once, but that wasn't Dick's fault. A lot I should have cared whose fault it was if it hurt," said the young mule. You must, said the troop horse. If you don't trust your man, you may as well run away at once. That's what some of our horses do, and I don't blame them. As I was saying, it wasn't Dick's fault. The man was lying on the ground, and I stretched myself not to tread on him, and he slashed up at me. Next time I have to go over a man lying down, I shall step on him hard." Hm, said Billy. It sounds very foolish. Knives are dirty things at any time. The proper thing to do is to climb up a mountain with a well-balanced saddle, hang on by all four feet and your ears too, and creep and crawl and wriggle along till you come out hundreds of feet above anyone else on a ledge where there's just room enough for your hooves. Then you stand still and keep quiet. Never ask a man to hold your head, young'un. Keep quiet while the guns are being put together, and then you watch the little poppy shells drop down into the treetops ever so far below. Don't you ever trip? said the troop horse. They say that when a mule trips you can split a hen's ear, said Billy. Now and again perhaps a badly packed saddle will upset a mule, but it's very seldom. I wish I could show you our business. It's beautiful. Why, it took me three years to find out what the men were driving at. The science of the thing is never to show up against the skyline, because if you do, you may get fired at. Remember that, young'un. Always keep hidden as much as possible, even if you have to go a mile out of your way. I lead the battery when it comes to that sort of climbing. Fired at without the chance of running into the people who are firing said the troop horse, thinking hard. I couldn't stand that. I should want to charge with Dick. Oh, no, you wouldn't. You know that as soon as the guns are in position they'll do all the charging. That's scientific and neat. But knives, pah! The baggage camel had been bobbing his head to and fro for some time past, anxious to get a word in edgewise. Then I heard him say, as he cleared his throat nervously, <clears> throat> I have fought a little, but not in that climbing way or that running way." "'No, now that you mention it,' said Billy, "'you don't look as though you were made for climbing or running much. Well, how was it, old hay bales?' "'The proper way,' said the camel. We all sat down—' "'Oh, my crupper and breastplate,' said the troop horse under his breath, "'sat down.' We sat down, 
A hundred of us, the camel went on, in a big square, and the men piled our packs and saddles outside the square, and they fired over our backs, the men did, on all sides of the square. What sort of men? Any men that came along? said the troop horse. They teach us in riding school to lie down and let our masters fire across us, but Dick Cutliffe is the only man I trust to do that. It tickles my girths, and besides, I can't see with my head on the ground. What does it matter who fires across you? said the camel. There are plenty of men and plenty of other camels close by, and a great many clouds of smoke. I am not frightened then. I sit still and wait. And yet, said Billy, you dream bad dreams and upset the camp at night. Well, well, before I'd lie down, not to speak of sitting down, and let a man fire across me, my heels and his head would have something to say to each other. Did you ever hear anything so awful as that? There was a long silence, and then one of the gun bullocks lifted up his big head and said, This is very foolish indeed. There is only one way of fighting. Oh, go on, said Billy. Please don't mind me. I suppose you fellows fight standing on your tails. Only one way, said the two together. They must have been twins. This is that way, to put all twenty yoke of us to the big gun as soon as two tails trumpets. Two tails is the camp slang for the elephant. What does two tails trumpet for? said the young mule. To show that he is not going any nearer to the smoke on the other side. Two tails is a great coward. Then we tug the big guns all together. Heya, halua, heya, halua. We do not climb like cats nor run like calves. We go across the level plain, twenty yoke of us, till we are unyoked again and we graze while the big guns talk across the plain to some town with mud walls, and a piece of the wall falls out, and the dust goes up as though many cattle were coming home. "'Oh, and you choose that time for grazing?' said the young mule. "'That time, or any other. Eating is always good. We eat till we are yoked up again, and tug the gun back to where Two Tails is waiting for it. Sometimes there are big guns in the city that speak back and some of us are killed, and then there is all the more grazing for those that are left. This is fate. None the less, Two Tails is a great coward. That is the proper way to fight. We are brothers from Hapur. Our father was a sacred bull of Shiva. We have spoken." "'Well, I've certainly learned something to-night,' said the troop horse. Do you, gentlemen of the screw-gun battery, feel inclined to eat when you are being fired at with the big guns, and Two Tails is behind you? About as much as we feel inclined to sit down and let men sprawl all over us, or run into people with knives. I never heard such stuff. A mountain ledge, a well-balanced load, a driver you can trust to let you pick your own way, and I'm your mule. But the other things, no, said Billy, with a stamp of his foot. Of course, said the troop horse, every one is not made in the same way, and I can quite see that your family, on your father's side, would fail to understand a great many things. Never you mind my family on my father's side, said Billy angrily, for every mule hates to be reminded that his father was a donkey. My father was a southern gentleman and he could pull down and bite and kick into rags every horse he came across. Remember that, you big brown Brumby." Brumby means wild horse without any breeding. Imagine the feelings of Sunall if a cart horse called her a skate. And you can imagine how the Australian horse felt. I saw the white of his eye glitter in the dark. "'See here, you son of an imported Malagog jackass,' he said between his teeth. I'd have you know that I'm related on my mother's side to Carbine, winner of the Melbourne Cup, and where I come from we aren't accustomed to being ridden over roughshod by any parrot-mouthed, pig-headed mule in a pop-gun pea-shooter battery. Are you ready?" On your hind legs, squealed Billy. They both reared up facing each other, and I was expecting a furious fight when a gurgly, rumbly voice called out of the darkness to the right, "'Children, what are you fighting about there? Be quiet!' Both beasts dropped down with a snort of disgust, 
for neither horse nor mule can bear to listen to an elephant's voice. It's two tails, said the troop horse. I can't stand him. A tail at each end isn't fair. My feelings exactly, said Billy, crowding into the troop horse for company. We're very alike in some things. I suppose we've inherited them from our mothers, said the troop horse. It's not worth quarreling about. Hi, Two Tails, are you tied up? Yes, said Two Tails with a laugh all up his trunk. I'm picketed for the night. I've heard what you fellows have been saying, but don't be afraid, I'm not coming over. The bullocks and the camel said half aloud, Afraid of Two Tails? What nonsense! And the bullocks went on. We are sorry that you heard, but it is true. Two Tails, why are you afraid of the guns when they fire? Well, said Two Tails, rubbing one hind leg against the other, exactly like a little boy saying a poem, I don't quite know whether you'd understand. We don't, but we have to pull the guns, said the bullocks. I know it, and I know you are a good deal braver than you think you are, but it's different with me. My battery captain called me a pachydermatous anachronism the other day. That's another way of fighting, I suppose, said Billy, who was recovering his spirits. You don't know what that means, of course, but I do. It means betwixt and between, and that is just where I am. I can see inside my head what will happen when the shell bursts, and you bullocks can't." "'I can,' said the troop horse, at least a little bit. I try not to think about it. I can see more than you, and I do think about it. I know there's a great deal of me to take care of, and I know that nobody knows how to cure me when I'm sick. All they can do is stop my driver's pay till I get well, and I can't trust my driver. Ah, said the troop horse, that explains it. I can trust Dick. You could put a whole regiment of Dicks on my back without making me feel any better. I know just enough to be uncomfortable and not enough to go on in spite of it. We do not understand, said the bullocks. I know you don't. I'm not talking to you. You don't know what blood is. We do, said the bullocks. It is red stuff that soaks into the ground and smells. The troop horse gave a kick and a bound and a snort. Don't talk of it, he said. I can smell it now, just thinking of it. It makes me want to run, when I haven't Dick on my back. But it is not here, said the camel and the bullocks. Why are you so stupid? It's vile stuff, said Billy. I don't want to run, but I don't want to talk about it. There you are, said Two Tails, waving his tail to explain. Surely, yes, we have been here all night, said the bullocks. Two Tails stamped his foot till the iron ring on it jingled. Oh, I'm not talking to you. You can't see inside your heads. No, we see out of our four eyes, said the bullocks. We see straight in front of us. If I could do that and nothing else, you wouldn't be needed to pull the big guns at all. If I was like my captain, he can see things inside his head before the firing begins, and he shakes all over, but he knows too much to run away. If I was like him, I could pull the guns, but if I were as wise as all that, I should never be here. I should be a king in the forest, as I used to be, sleeping half the day and bathing when I liked. I haven't had a good bath for a month." "'That's all very fine,' said Billy. But giving a thing a long name doesn't make it any better. Hush, said the troop horse. I think I understand what Two Tails means. You'll understand better in a minute, said Two Tails angrily. Now you just explain to me why you don't like this. He began trumpeting furiously at the top of his trumpet. Stop that, said Billy and the troop horse together, and I could hear them stamp and shiver. An elephant's trumpeting is always nasty, especially on a dark night. "'I shan't stop,' said Two Tails. "'Won't you explain that, please?' <coughs> then he stopped suddenly, and I heard a little whimper in the dark, and knew that Vixen had found me at last. She knew as well as I did that if there is one thing in the world the elephant is more afraid of than another, it is a little barking dog. 
So she stopped to bully Two Tails in his pickets and yapped round his big feet. Two Tails shuffled and squeaked. Go away, little dog, he said. Don't snuff at my ankles or I'll kick you. Good little dog, nice little doggy, then. Go home, you yelping little beast. Oh, why doesn't someone take her away? She'll bite me in a minute. Seems to me, said Billy to the troop horse, that our friend Two Tails is afraid of most things. Now if I had a full meal for every dog I've kicked across the parade ground, I should be as fat as Two Tails nearly. I whistled, and Vixen ran up to me, muddy all over, and licked my nose, and told me a long tale about hunting for me all through the camp. I never let her know that I understood beast talk, or she would have taken all sorts of liberties. So I buttoned her into the breast of my overcoat, and Two Tails shuffled and stamped and growled to himself. Extraordinary, most extraordinary, he said. It runs in our family. Now where has that nasty little beast gone to? I heard him feeling about with his trunk. We all seem to be affected in various ways, he went on, blowing his nose. Now you gentlemen were alarmed, I believe, when I trumpeted. Not alarmed exactly, said the troop horse, but it made me feel as though I had harness where my saddle ought to be. Don't begin again. I'm frightened of a little dog, and the camel here is frightened by bad dreams in the night. It is very lucky for us that we haven't all got to fight in the same way, said the troop horse. What I want to know, said the young mule, who had been quiet for a long time, what I want to know is why we have to fight at all. Because we're told to, said the troop horse with a snort of contempt. Orders, said Billy the mule, and his teeth snapped. Hukum hai. It is an order, said the camel with a gurgle, and two tails and the bullocks repeated, Hogum hai. Yes, but who gives the orders? said the recruit mule. The man who walks at your head, or sits on your back, or holds your nose rope, or twists your tail, said Billy, and the troop horse and the camel and the bullocks one after the other. But who gives them the orders? Now you want to know too much, young'un, said Billy, and that is one way of getting kicked. All you have to do is to obey the man at your head and ask no questions. He's quite right, said Two Tails. I can't always obey because I'm betwixt and between. But Billy's right. Obey the man next to you who gives the order, or you'll stop all the battery, besides getting a thrashing. The gun bullocks got up to go. Morning is coming, they said. We will go back to our lines. It is true that we only see out of our eyes, and we are not very clever, but still we are the only people to-night who have not been afraid. Good night, you brave people." Nobody answered, and the troop horse said, to change the conversation, "'Where's that little dog? A dog means a man somewhere about.' "'Here I am,' yapped Vixen, "'under the tail-gun with my man. You big blundering beast of a camel, you! You upset our tent. My man's very angry.' Phew, said the bullocks, he must be white. Of course he is, said Vixen. Do you suppose I'm looked after by a black bullock driver? Oh, 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 said the bullocks, let us get away quickly. They plunged forward in the mud and managed, somehow, to run their yoke on the pole of an ammunition wagon where it jammed. Now you have done it, said Billy calmly. Don't struggle. You're hung up till daylight. What on earth's the matter?" The bullocks went off into the long, hissing snorts that Indian cattle give, and pushed and crowded and slewed and stamped and slipped, and nearly fell down in the mud, grunting savagely. "'You'll break your necks in a minute,' said the troop horse. "'What's the matter with white men? I'll live with them.' "'They eat us. Pull,' said the near bullock. The yoke snapped with a twang, and they lumbered off together. I never knew before what made Indian cattle so scared of Englishmen. We eat beef, a thing that no cattle driver touches, and of course the cattle do not like it. May I be flogged with my own pad chains? Who'd have thought of two big lumps like those losing their heads? said Billy. Never mind, I'm going to look at this man. Most of the white men I know have things in their pockets, said the troop horse. I'll leave you, then. I can't say I'm over-fond of em myself. Besides, white men who haven't a place to sleep in are more than likely to be thieves. 
and I've a good deal of government property on my back. Come along, young'un, and we'll go back to our lines. Good night, Australia. See you on parade tomorrow, I suppose. Good night, old hay bale. Try to control your feelings, won't you? Good night, Two Tails. If you pass us on the ground tomorrow, don't trumpet. It spoils our formation. Billy the Mule stumped off with the swaggering limp of an old campaigner, as the troop horse's head came nuzzling into my breast, and I gave him biscuits, while Vixen, who is a most conceited little dog, told him fibs about the scores of horses that she and I kept. "'I'm coming to the parade tomorrow in my dog-cart,' she said. "'Where will you be?' "'On the left hand of the second squadron. I set the time for all my troop, little lady,' he said politely. Now I must go back to Dick. My tail's all muddy, and he'll have two hours' hard work dressing me for parade." The big parade of all the thirty thousand men was held that afternoon, and Vixen and I had a good place close to the Viceroy and the Amir of Afghanistan, with high big black hat of ostracon wool and the great diamond star in the center. The first part of the review was all sunshine and the regiments went by in wave upon wave of legs all moving together, and guns all in line, till our eyes grew dizzy. Then the cavalry came up to the beautiful cavalry canter of Bonnie Dundee, and Vixen cocked her ear where she sat on the dog-cart. The second squadron of the lancers shot by, and there was the troop horse, with his tail like spun silk, his head pulled into his breast, one ear forward and one back setting the time for all his squadron, his legs going as smoothly as waltz music. Then the big guns came by, and I saw two tails and two other elephants harnessed in line to a forty-pounder siege-gun, while twenty yoke of oxen walked behind. The seventh pair had a new yoke, and they looked rather stiff and tired. Last came the screw-guns, and Billy the Mule carried himself as though he commanded all the troops, and his harness was oiled and polished till it winked. I gave a cheer all by myself for Billy the Mule, but he never looked right or left. The rain began to fall again, and for a while it was too misty to see what the troops were doing. They had made a big half-circle across the plain, and were spreading out into a line. That line grew and grew and grew till it was three-quarters of a mile long from wing to wing, one solid wall of men, horses, and guns. Then it came on, straight toward the Viceroy and the Amir, and as it got nearer the ground began to shake, like the deck of a steamer when the engines are going fast. Unless you have been there, you cannot imagine what a frightening effect this steady come-down of troops has on the spectators, even when they know it is only a review. I looked at the Amir. Up till then he had not shown the shadow of a sign of astonishment or anything else. But now his eyes began to get bigger and bigger, and he picked up the reins on his horse's neck and looked behind him. For a minute it seemed as though he were going to draw his sword and slash his way out through the English men and women in the carriages at the back. Then the advance stopped dead. The ground stood still, the whole line saluted, and thirty bands began to play all together. That was the end of the review, and the regiments went off to their camps in the rain, and an infantry band struck up with the animals went in two by two, hurrah! The animals went in two by two, the elephant and the battery mule, and they all got into the ark for to get out of the rain. Then I heard an old grizzled, long-haired Central Asian chief, who had come down with the emir, asking questions of a native officer. No, said he, in what manner was this wonderful thing done? And the officer answered, An order was given, and they obeyed. But are the beasts as wise as the men? said the chief. They obey, as the men do. Mule, horse, elephant, or bullock, he obeys his driver, and the driver his sergeant, and the sergeant his lieutenant, and the lieutenant his captain, and the captain his major, and the major his colonel, and the colonel his brigadier, commanding three regiments, and the brigadier the general, who obeys the viceroy, who is the servant of the empress. Thus it is done. Would it were so in Afghanistan, said the chief, for there we obey only our own wills. And for that reason, said the native officer, twirling his moustache, 
your amir whom you do not obey must come here and take orders from our viceroy parade song of the camp animals elephants of the gun teams we lent to alexander the strength of hercules the wisdom of our foreheads the cunning of our knees we bowed our necks to service they ne'er were loosed again make way there way for the ten-foot teams of the forty-pounder train gun bullocks those hero in their harnesses avoid a cannon-ball and what they know of powder upsets them one and all then we come into action and tug the guns again make way there way for the twenty yoke of the forty-pounder train cavalry horses by the brand on my shoulder the finest of tunes is played by the lancers hussars and dragoons and it's sweeter than stables or water to me the cavalry canter of bonnie dundee then feed us and break us and handle and groom and give us good riders and plenty of room and launch us in columns of squadron and see the way of the war-horse to bonnie dundee screw gun mules as me and my companions were scrambling up a hill the path was lost in rolling stones but we went forward still for we can wriggle and climb my lads and turn up everywhere oh it's our delight on a mountain height with a leg or two to spare good luck to every sergeant then that lets us pick our road bad luck to all the driver men that cannot pack a load for we can wriggle and climb my lads and turn up everywhere oh it's our delight on a mountain height with a leg or two to spare Commissariat Camels We haven't a camely tune of our own to help us trollop along, but every neck is a hair trombone, rat -tat, tat is a hair trombone, and this our marching song. Can't, don't, shan't, won't, pass it along the line. Somebody's pack has slid from his back, wish it were only mine. Somebody's load is tipped off in the road, cheer for a halt and a row. Er, yar, grr, ah, somebody's catching it now. All the beasts together. Children of the camp are we, serving each in his degree. Children of the yoke and goad, pack and harness, pad and load. See our line across the plain, like a heel rope bent again, reaching, writhing, rolling far, sweeping all away to war, while the men that walk beside dusty silent heavy-eyed cannot tell why we are they march and suffer day by day children of the camp are we serving each in his degree children of the yoke and goad pack and harness pad and load end of her majesty's servants and parade song of the camp animals end of the jungle book by rudyard kipling this book recorded by Phil Chenevere, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, June 2012.